Stanislas Mikoshevsky, the Secretary of St. John the Baptist Pro Life League, will be our speaker. He will be talking about the importance of the ultrasound and how we need to pass laws that make abortion clinics show the mother of the baby an ultrasound before having an abortion. Please join me in welcoming Stanislas. Good afternoon, everyone. In the world today, we have a big problem with abortion. Since 1970 to 2016, there has been about 46.7 million legal abortions. That's 46.7 million legal abortions. We know this is a black and white matter, but some people in the world do not know this. And this is why we need to stand up and fight against abortion. One way we can do this is by making abortion clinics show the mothers an ultrasound of the baby before they decide to get an abortion. An ultrasound is a medical term for a scan that allows doctors to safely see inside a patient's body. According to the Oxford Dictionary, quote, an ultrasound uses inaudible sound waves to create a picture of a person's internal organs, muscles, bones, and other body parts, end quote. We can clearly see that if we got doctors to show this to their patients before they got an abortion, they might change their mind about having the abortion and see that it's really a baby. But they won't do this because they want people to believe that an abortion is right and not wrong, and they, want, they don't want people to believe that it's actually murder. But people do not want to face the truth. The world is afraid of truth and tries to get rid of any goodness in it. We need to bring the truth back to people and everyone in the world. We can do this by making the doctors show ultrasounds to their patients. There are a few things that we can do in order to get the world to see the wrong in abortion. According to State Health Facts, a website about filling the trustee needs of information on national health issues says, quote, some states have passed laws and policies that require a woman seeking an abortion to receive information on accessing, accessing ultrasound services, while others require that a woman undergo an ultrasound before an abortion. Routine ultrasound is not considered medically necessary for an abortion, end quote. Here are some statistics from the same website. 26 of the 50 states require an ultrasound before an abortion. 14 of those 15 states require a doctor to explain the ultrasound to the family, and three of those states require the family to see those images of the ultrasound. We need to bring these laws into effect in order to change the laws on abortion. After having an ultrasound, quite a few women change their minds about having an abortion. According to Rachel Duffy, a newspaper writer says, quote, that 90% of women who, are having, who have an ultrasound change their mind about abortion, end quote. These statistics came from the Knights of Columbus. Rachel Duffy also says, quote, quotes, now it's true that once a father or mother who are see seeking an abortion see an ultrasound, 90% of them decide to not have an abortion. Our opposition may not like these results. These are what people decide, and these are the facts, and you can't change them, end quote. She also goes to say that, quote, reports indicate that up to 90% of women considering an abortion choose to, have to, choose to have their baby after an ultrasound image, end quote. And another person, a business coach and mentor, Karen Kiskang, who is a mentor in the United Kingdom, says, quote, any woman who has felt a baby stirring inside her, any man who has seen the tiny heartbeat pulsing on ultrasound screen, knows that the abortion is the ending of life. This is a striking fact because you really see that it is really murder. Rachel Duffy also says, quote, they hear their baby's heartbeat, they see their baby's head and fingers, they know it's a child, not a choice. They know it's a child and not a choice, end quote. As we see, life is one of the most important things in the world, and this is how we came into this world. So we should not take away the life of helpless babies. We need to stand up and be the voices for these unborn babies so we can make a difference in the world. We also need to support these laws because 90% of mothers change their mind after seeing an ultrasound. I would like to end with a quote from Ronald Reagan, the 40th President of the United States. Quote, I have noticed that everyone who is for abortion has already been born. End quote. Thank you. Mary Josephine will now speak about my body, my choice, and how the babies also have the right to live. Good afternoon. 
Women were given by God the privilege to bear children and bring them into the world. This privilege is being ruined by women, many women through abortion. They are willing to have the baby whip, ripped out of their room, womb because to them it is an inconvenience. But, and they use this through the slogan, my body, my choice. This slogan does not justify the uncruel killing of innocent children. Women claim the baby to be a part of their body when they say it is my choice. The baby they are carrying is not a part of them. It may be in their body, but it is not part of their body. That baby depends on the mother for food, but the mother does not depend on the baby. Kirsten Washin, pregnant with twin boys, in a statement on video live action, states, it's, quote, it's just not my body here. There are three bodies. Some people try to say that children in the womb are part of the woman's body. If a child in the womb were literally part of a woman's body, then I would have three hearts, three brains, 30 fingers, and because there are two boys in there, I'd be mostly male, end quote. And the humanlifeinternational.org also states, quote, all mothers are obviously female. About half of their children are male. How can a human being be both male and female, end quote? This clearly states that the baby is separate from the mother. Women bring, in bring into the world both sexes. She cannot be male and female. She is clearly just female. Women say that it is within their rights that they can have the baby aborted. Yes, women do have rights to their own body to protect it, but when they are pregnant, they have two bodies to care for, their own and the baby. Humanlife.org states, quote, pro-lifers agree that a woman does indeed have the right to manage her own health. However, maintaining that right does not allow the mother to destroy her child's body. When she conceived, she had already passed the right to new life, end quote. That baby that she has conceived also has a right. On the news, when you hear of the Women's March, all you hear about is how women's body rights are being hurt. Women are not the only ones that have rights. Everybody has rights, even that baby. You can't see it, it can't speak yet, but it has rights. And Kirsten Watson again states on live action, quote, a right is not a right if I only apply it to me and remain unwilling to grant to others what I ask for myself. To put it simply, a woman's rights over her own body does not include the right to end the life of an innocent human being, end quote. Those children that are being slaughtered also have rights. They have the right to live. We all have a right to live. So in conclusion, the quote, the slogan, my body, my choice, does not justify the killing of innocent children and it must be stopped. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maria Camardo. Maria is the Vice President of the St. John the Baptist Pro-Life League. She will address a few of the myths that Planned Parenthood spreads to deceive citizens and conceal their operations. Good afternoon. Abortion is wrong. As Catholics and as pro-lifers, we know that. No battle can be fought without two sides. We can't fight without an enemy. And surprisingly, that enemy knows that abortion is wrong as well. That's why Planned Parenthood spreads myths about what they do, so that we won't know the actual truth. Because of time constraints, I'll just go into a few of the more basic myths that Planned Parenthood supports and hopefully show you why they are false. Myth number one, abortion comprises only 3% of services offered by Planned Parenthood. In addition to providing abortions, Planned Parenthood also offers services such as STD testing, cancer screening and testing, hormone therapy, and infertility treatment. According to Planned Parenthood, the organization exists primarily to offer these other services, and abortion comprises only 3% of their services. This is false. Planned Parenthood messes with the numbers. If a woman receives a well patient exam, hormone therapy, cancer screening, and an abortion from Planned Parenthood, then according to the organization, she has received four services, only 25% of which were abortion. Therefore, 
According to Planned Parenthood, abortion makes, um, makes up only a small percentage of what the organization actually does. In reality, Abby Johnson, a former Planned Parenthood clinic director, says in her book Unplanned that as a corporate organization, profit is key. Abortion brings in the money. Therefore, Planned Parenthood will do anything to keep abortion numbers and hence profit as high as possible. Myth number two, an unborn fetus is not a person. This myth forms the entire basis of the pro-choice argument. If a baby is not a baby, then it is not protected by law, and it is nothing more than a disposable clump of cells inside a woman's body, like a tumor. Listfirst.com, which by the way is not a pro-life website, has an excellent article on abortion survivors. This website described the process of saline abortion, where a saltwater solution is injected into the uterus and essentially, quote, burns the fetus to death, end quote. I don't know about you, but in order to be burned to death, you'd think this fetus would have to be living and therefore being. Is that not the definition of a person? Melissa Oden and Gianna Jessen are both survivors of saline abortion procedures. Their half-burned, still-living bodies were found in hospital waste heaps after the procedure failed. They were clearly alive then, and thanks be to God, they still are. How can you deny the life or personhood of an unborn fetus in the face of these facts? Myth number three, abortion is simply a part of reproductive health care. Before I begin this myth, I'd like to share a story with you. The Harvard Press is a newspaper pub published in this town, Harvard. Recently, the minister of the Unitarian Universalist Church, Reverend Jill Cowie, wrote a letter to the editor of the Harvard Press. It was not so much a letter as a call to support the Roe Act. The content of the letter was absolutely appalling. This minister, who by the way has herself had an abortion, holds that abortion is a right because it is, quote, reproductive health care, end quote. Reverend Cowie voiced her fear that women are being, quote unquote, denied reproductive health care access. This is absolutely selfish. Abortion is not health care, it is murder. Health care means protecting life, not destroying it. Margaret Sanger's purpose in founding Planned Parenthood was to eliminate the entire African American race. That doesn't sound like healthcare to me. Reverend Jill Cowie is alive and healthy today. However, her baby is neither alive nor healthy. Is that healthcare? I hope that in just a few minutes, I've shown you the truth be behind some of the lies Planned Parenthood spreads, some of which are the percentage of services abortion makes up, the personhood of a fetus, and the nature of abortion itself. This is the type of propaganda we are exposed to day in and day out. And this, my friends, is where our tax dollars are going. As a result, our brothers and sisters are being slaughtered continuously because too few know the truth and too few are willing to stand up for the truth. As today's youth and tomorrow's leaders, it is up to you and to me to stand up and act for those who died because of a lie. As Socrates so plainly put it, quote, there is one good knowledge and one evil ignorance, end quote. Let us pray for an end to abortion, an end to ignorance, and the restoration of truth. Thank you. Next, Leela Festa will prove that environment does not affect the personhood of a fetus or any other human being. Good afternoon. When a pro-lifer comes in contact with someone who supports the pro-choice movement, there are a few our main arguments that often come up um, when talking to them. The main point of each of their arguments is that a fetus is not a person. One of these basis, bases is they say that a fetus, because a fetus is not separate from the mother, it is not, technically speaking, a person. I say that environment does not affect the personhood of a fetus or of any human being. To illustrate my point, let me tell you a little story. If you remember 10 years ago, August 5th, 2010, there was a catastrophic cave-in at the San Jose mine near Copiaco, Chile. 33 miners were trapped 2,000 feet under the ground. Their families were devastated. They had little hope that 
their uh, husbands, fathers had survived. Yet with the little hope that they had, they sent out rescue teams to search for some way to determine if there was, they were still alive under there. They searched for 17 days with no results. Yet, on the 17th day, they sent a drill down through one of the holes in the rubble, and it came back with a note attached to the end, saying that all 33 miners were still alive down there. Those miners survived until the middle of October when they were finally rescued, surviving on what little rations that they had, and until they could find a way to finally extract them from under all that rock. Now, compare this to a fetus in a womb. Th those men were underground for nearly three months. The fetus, you cannot see them, you cannot feel them in any way. Just as those miners, there was little to no signs that they were still down there, yet their families still search for them. How is a fetus any different? We know that it is alive in there, because from six weeks, you can hear its heartbeat. We know it is a human, and it is separate from its mother's body, even though it is still in the womb. A child in a rich family is just as much a person as a child in a poor family, and vice versa. A child who is treated well versus a child who is in an abusive household. Both are still people. Thus, we can show that the environment that any person is in at any given time including a fetus in its mother's womb, is still a person. Thank you. Our next speech will be presented by Namson, who will defend the lives of babies with Down syndrome. So when my aunt was pregnant with my cousin, she went to the doctors for a physical checkup, and after the ultrasound, the doctor said to her that my cousin had a chance for Down syndrome. His recommendation to her then was to abort him. She refused. And today, my cousin is a healthy ninth grade boy who plays soccer and basketball, no Down syndrome at all, and he's one of my best friends. Dr. Brian Scotto, a pediatric geneticist at Children's Hospital in Boston, said that, says that out of 100 babies who are diagnosed with Down syndrome, 92 end up aborted. 92 end up aborted. Today, doctors tell parents of children with Down syndrome that their babies will never be happy, that they are better off dead, and that we are doing them a favor by killing them. This is wrong because this is wrong because there is no proof to show that babies with Down syndrome will never be happy, and I will show you why. So we belong to the truth. We are in the church, and the church tells us clearly what is true and what is wrong. Society today has fallen from the truth, so it doesn't know what is true and what is false, and it doesn't know it can't tell for itself, everything is opinion. But the Bible tells us clearly that life is a gift, a gift from God. And our conscience, when it is clear, it can tell us through the natural law that killing is wrong. Everyone knows this. So the claim that children with Down syndrome will never be happy is wrong, as I stated before, because it has no, tr it has no proof. Let's look at a study published by the American Journal of Medical Genetics, which surveyed, with, excuse me, which surveyed people with Down syndrome. It shows that 99% of people with Down syndrome were happy with their lives. 99%. 97% liked who they are. 96% liked how they looked. 86% indicated that they could make friends easily. Only 4% Ex expressed sorrow of their lives. I don't know if you've ever, ever met, the, had the opportunity of meeting someone with Down syndrome, but they are one of the most cheerful, sweetest, and inspiring people out there. So the claim that they'll, they will be miserable is absolutely ridiculous because there is no proof to show that they will be miserable, and rather the contrary. Another aspect of this 
uh, another aspect of the of the pro-death cause is that it is unfair for a parent to be expected to raise a child with a disability. First of all, a parent is expected to raise their child, whether the condition that they're in. Second of all, we have a word for this kind of thinking, that is discrimination. And third, even if we ignore my first two points, there still is no proof that a parent would suffer under having a child with Down syndrome. According to another study from the National Institute of Health, which surveyed parents of children with Down syndrome, it reports that 99% of parents reported that they loved their son or daughter, 97% were proud of their child, 79% felt that their outlook on life was more positive because of their child with Down syndrome, only 4% regretted having them. Furthermore, the American Psychological Association shared that 28% of women regretted their abortion within two years. Let's think about this for a moment. If 4% of women regretted having a child with Down syndrome and 28% of women regretted having an abortion at all, that means that a woman is seven times more likely to regret her abortion than regret having a child with Down syndrome. That's incredible. So why does society hide this? It is hidden from us because it's propaganda from pro-abortion industries who only think about themselves and want to increase their profit. To conclude, <clears throat> my cousin, I'm sorry. Life is a gift to all of us, and it's given to us from God. And it is not our choice, it is not the right of a mother, and it's not the right of a doctor to say whether or not a baby's life is valuable. It isn't, the life of a baby is not dependent on anything, but that it is a baby. I'll repeat that. The value of the life of a baby is not dependent on anything, but that this is a baby. It's a baby, so therefore, it has value. It is in, no matter if it's inside the womb or outside the womb, no matter if it's healthy or unhealthy, no matter if, it, if the mother wants it or if the mother doesn't, it's still a baby and it still has a right to life. If my aunt had not realized this, I am not so sure my cousin would be here today, but since she knew that he was a gift to her from God, there was no way she could have rejected him. Our Lady of Guadalupe, patron of the unborn, pray for us. Our next speaker is Kylie, who will be talking about abortion's permanent damage to history, the present, and the future, as well as global and economic ripple effects. Abortion leaves holes in history's pages and tears in the fabric of time. Everything eternal has a role in both history and eternity, and every human soul is eternal. It is impossible to know what our world would look like if the countless millions of people slaughtered in their mother's wombs were with us today. Maybe we would have a cure for cancer. Maybe some lonely people would have spouses. Maybe some lonely children would have friends. Maybe some only children would have siblings. Maybe some old women would have offspring to love and care for them. Maybe some mothers who chose suicide after aborting their children would still be alive with us today. Along with the damage to history left by abortion that we could never fully see or fathom. There are some uh, abortion also damages the economy and perpetuates global problems in ways that we can clearly see. One fourth to one third of the generations since Roe versus Wade have been sanitarily discarded of 
through abortion. <clears throat> How does missing these people, sentenced to be thrown away in trash bags for the crime of inconvenience, affect those of us who have survived our time in utero? <clears throat> Regarding the economic effects of abortion, the website www.prb.org in its article about global aging says, quote, in the past, when demographers projected national and global populations, the projections commonly assumed that birth rates would decline worldwide, but only to the two-child family, i.e. two children per woman or per couple on average. An assumption that fertility would fall below this rate Ray would have some unpleasant consequences. A decrease in population size and a, decrease, and a population top-heavy with retired seniors who would depend upon the social taxes paid by a dwindling number of younger workers. While it may not have been desirable to project such a gloomy scenario in the past, this is exactly what has transpired in many countries. So you can see the exterminating millions and millions of people not only leaves wounds in people's hearts and in people's lives, but it also has some major economic damage to many countries, and we can see this today. <clears throat> Another um, thing that I would like to bring up is the fact that abortion is a solution to a non-existent problem that covers up the true problems. Today, people would like you to believe that pregnancy is a major problem. Now, there are many, many real problems in the world today, but pregnancy is not one of them. Regarding this, actress and producer Megan Clancy said, quote, there are women who are raped and become pregnant. The problem is that they were raped, not that they are pregnant. There are women who are starving who become pregnant. The problem is that they are starving, not that they are pregnant. There are women in abusive relationships who become pregnant. The problem is that they are in abusive relationships, not that they are pregnant." End quote. So if we are treating, if we are treating pregnancy as a problem, we are not addressing the real problems in this world. And we cannot address the real problems in this world when we are saying that murder is a solution to something that is not a problem. So we have to fight to end abortion because abortion is murder. And if we can abolish murder, not only will we be able to uh, be supporting life, but also we'll be able to better address the real problems in this world. <clears throat> If we want hope for the future, we must work to stop this crime. <clears throat> the gaps abortion has left in history's pages can never be filled, but we can prevent the same tears from being created in the future. We must work to end abortion so that we can find a cure for cancer, so that the lonely can have spouses, so lonely children can have friends, so children can have siblings, so old women can have children to care for them, and so that mothers will choose their own lives along with their children's and not desire suicide. We all have a duty not only to pray, but to fight for life. It is important to be prayer warriors, but the Bible says that faith without works is dead. So we must also take action, not only pray, but action as well. <clears throat> Everything is intimately connected in this world. And if we do not stop robbing our most innocent of life, we will see the repercussions and they will not be good. They will be unfathomably tragic and the collateral damage will not be repairable. Thank you. Stephen Alexander will now speak about the detrimental effects of abortion in the spiritual realm. Good afternoon. The effects abortion has on society and on the individual are detrimental and undeniable. 
Where its devastation is most felt, however, is in the spiritual realm. It came as a great shock to me to find out that so-called Christians were pro-abortion. The reason this was so unfathomable, unfathomable to me was because to be Christian is to love. Christ himself is love. Now, because we have this great intimacy with the virtue of love, this is what makes abortion so terrible. To hate is to wish someone to go to hell. Now, abortion causes the doctor, the mother, and the father to go to hell. These people deserve this, and in God's great ju justice, he delivers the sentence. Who doesn't deserve this sentence, however, is the child. This child is innocent, and because of decisions made by its parents, it is robbed of the beatific vision. The reason some Christians can say that they are pro-abortion, pro-choice as they call it, is because they do not believe that children who are aborted before being baptized can be deprived of God's grace and his mercy in heaven. As Catholics, we know that limbo is where these children go. It is a place of perfect material happiness, but they still do not get to see God. And this is the greatest crime. The way we can prove limbo is through a combination of scripture and tradition. In scripture, John tells us through a quote of our Lord, unless a man be born again of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Even, even Protestants who believe solely in the Bible cannot deny or cannot claim rather that a child unbaptized can get into heaven when it is so clearly stated in scripture. So how could they say that abortion is acceptable? When the child dies and does not have sanctifying grace, he cannot get to heaven. So their solution is that children who are unbaptized go to heaven and are therefore perfectly happy. This makes abortion seem not as a problem, but as the greatest thing to ever happen on this earth. It just sends children straight to heaven. But we know that through But we know that these children are robbed of the greatest good that our Lord has ever given to us. It is important to approach this subject to the mothers and fathers with love because we cannot change them. We cannot change their hearts with just cold hard facts. We must approach them with clemency and with compassion. In order to do this, we must know every, our facts but also realize that they are people too, and that souls are at stake. The next time you hear a Christian try to tell you that abortion is acceptable, you remember that to be Christian is to love, and to love is to be compassionate and try to convert souls, not only the souls of the children, to try to get them into the world and baptize so that they may have a chance at heaven, but also the souls of the mother and the father and the pro-abortion doctors who perform these atrocities. Thank you. Now our president of the Pro-Life League, Margaret Duffy, will speak to us about the founder of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger. There are few who realize what Sanger was really trying to bring about through birth control because she is widely celebrated in the secular world as a women's rights activist. For the truth about Margaret Sanger, 
Here is Margaret Duffy. Good afternoon. To say that Margaret Sanger had a fair impact on today's culture would be an understatement. So much of the popular agenda comes from the ideo ideology started by this woman about a hundred years ago. She is praised to no end by feminists and supporters of Planned Parenthood, which she founded. The Margaret Sanger Award is given annually to, quote, recognize leadership, excellence, and outstanding contributions to the reproductive health and rights movement, end quote. She is also responsible for the term birth control, which she coined, and for the vast success it has had. Was Margaret Sanger the great liberator of women that she is portrayed to be? On the contrary, she tried to break down the laws that protected the innocent from evil people like herself. In her book, Woman in the New Race, published in 1923, Sanger wrote, quote, birth control itself, often denounced as a violation of natural law, is nothing more or less than the facilitation of the process of weeding out the unfit, of preventing the birth of defectives, or of those who will become defectives, end quote. Margaret Louise Higgins was born on, in Corning, New York, on September 14, 1879, the sixth of 11 children of an Irish working class family. She was baptized a Catholic, but would later discard her religion. Margaret's mother died at an early age, which Margaret later attributed to her many pregnancies and miscarriages. Wishing for a better life, she went on to college at Claverack College and the Hudson River Institute in 1896. She went on to study nursing at White Plains Hospital four years later. In 1902, she married William Sanger, and they eventually had three children. Sanger started her sex education campaign in 1912 by writing a newspaper column called What Every Girl Should Know. Through her work as a nurse in the Lower East Side of New York, Margaret Sanger came across many poor immigrant women. She believed they suffered from too many pregnancies or being forced to commit an illegal abortion, so she worked to make contraceptives available. In 1914, Sanger started a feminist publication called The Woman Rebel, which promoted a woman's right to have birth control. This landed her in trouble, and she fled to England for five years. Sanger returned to the United States in October 1915, after charges against her had been dropped. She began touring to promote birth control, a term that she coined. In 1916, she opened the first birth control clinic in the United States. Up until the day she died, Sanger worked to advocate birth control, running into trouble with the law several times, especially in the beginning. The reason that Sanger founded Planned Parenthood, and which is often covered up, was that she was a huge promoter of eugenics. She advocated, as she said herself, quote, a stern and rigid policy of sterilization and segregation to that grade of population whose progeny is already tainted or whose inheritance is such that objectionable traits may be transmitted to offspring, end quote. And many people say that she helped women who were in trouble and had to get back alley abortions illegally. But on the other hand, she tried to break down laws that protected the innocent, the children in the womb, from being murdered. And Sanger knew that it was murder. And most people did know back then that it was murder. But she wanted abortion anyway so that she could promote eugenics. She said, quote, the most serious evil of our times is that of encouraging the bringing into the world of large families. The most immoral practice of the day is breeding too many children, end quote. And finally, the most merciful thing that the large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it, end quote. Thank you.